Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Brian Crane, and I'm here with Sunny Agarwal. Today, we're going to be interviewing Amir Taki, Rose O'Leary, and Ivan Yelinchich, who are uh, the co-founders of DarkFi. So DarkFi is a project that's working on uh, privacy uh, for smart contracts and privacy for decentralized finance. And we had a really long, really fantastic conversation with the three of them uh, that actually ended up going almost three hours. So we decided to split this up into two episodes. The first one's going to come out today as 423, and then the next one a week from now as 424. So uh, with that, uh, let's get into the first part. But before we do that, a few words from our sponsor. So first of all, uh, course one. So are you, do you have crypto assets or, you know, sitting around or do you want to participate in the staking economy? Then, you know, start earning rewards and contribute to network security by staking with Chorus One. Chorus One is securing billions of dollars of staking assets across 25 plus different decentralized network, including Solana, Cosmos, Ethereum and others. Course One also runs uh, nodes for institutions. So if you're interested in white label nodes or have some kind of staking needs that you want to have a partner for, make sure to check out Course One. So you go to course.one to start your staking journey. And then Paraswap. So Paraswap is a decentralized exchange aggregator on Ethereum. With Paraswap, you can beat the market price every single time. It's fast, it's very liquid, and they just launched a V5, which has new contract and new APIs. It has a modular in infrastructure, it's very gas friendly, and supports free approval using Ethereum permit messages. They also added support for Avalanche, Polygon, BSC, and uh, you can even use it from directly within Ledger Live. So go to paraswap.io to get started. And with that, let's go to our episode. So thanks so much for uh, joining us all. Um, we have like three guests, which is actually unusual. Normally we were always like, no, we, sh we shouldn't have so many guests, but let's do it. I think it's going to be fun. Maybe you can just start off by uh, everyone introducing themselves briefly. So I'm Amir Taki and I've been in uh, Bitcoin since uh, 2010 and I was working a lot on um, Bitcoin implementations uh, software, doing a lot of the protocol development and uh, with a specialty on um, privacy techniques. So our team implemented the first coin join implementation and stealth addresses, um, which have become like, uh, well, you know they're they're outdated now, but at the time, uh, but then they became standardized techniques. Uh, and in terms of DarkFi, which is our project now, uh, I focus a lot on on doing research and uh, applied cryptography development. You know, mainly around zero knowledge, but not contained just strictly to zero knowledge. You know, um, we're concerned with. Uh, combining many different techniques together to leverage to create uh, anonymous applications. I'm Rose. Uh, I've I got into crypto in um, 2015 when I read the Assange book uh, Cypherpunks, and um, since then I've uh, worked in a few different things. I was lead uh, tech writer for Coindesk for a couple of years, uh, where I was mostly writing on Ethereum and privacy coins. And during that time, I traveled a lot to different Ethereum conferences. Um, and it was interesting, you know, an interesting moment uh, in the space. But I also started to feel uh, very concerned about um, the the emphasis on transparency that a lot of the Ethereum uh, projects and also the Ethereum philosophy uh, has. So in, in 2018, I left, I, I went to Rojava, uh, learned programming and, uh, the following year started, uh, contributing to DarkFi. So I helped build the, um, prototype that we just released. Um, 
And I'm also a uh, researcher. I research mainly uh, DeFi and token engineering. Uh, I'm my turn. I've, I've been like, I've been a free software developer for maybe almost 15 years now. Um, uh, since I was 18, I moved to the Netherlands and started working on free software with this uh, nonprofit foundation called Dyn. Uh, in there, we developed many projects, both crypto-related and not crypto-related, uh, mostly in regards to the European Union and privacy aspects of various different softwares and, and politics. So we also involved with cities and uh, um, uh, municipalities. Uh, we've developed many, uh, many different projects that uh, helped people uh, integrate privately into society in some way. Um, when it comes to crypto, I found out about Bitcoin, I think, in 2012 or something like this. Uh, immediately loved it, started mining it, and uh, ha hung out a lot on the Bitcoin forums. Um, I, took, I think I took a break around 2014 or 2015 when mining wasn't as profitable anymore. So I just like, stagnated and kept working on free software. Uh, in the meantime, I've founded a couple of projects. Uh, there was a Linux operating system called DevOne, which is now one of the most popular Linux distributions used in the world. Um, spawned from this, there were uh, two different projects as well. One was called HeadsOS, with a big focus on anonymity and privacy. And the other one is now currently still in development, uh, MIMO, which is a mobile operating system designed and built uh, from scratch uh, in order to like escape escape the clutches of the Apple and the Google duopolies. And uh, right now I'm thinking of how to also involve these projects with crypto. Uh, when it comes to DarkFi, uh, I've been... Uh, Amir introduced me to Zero Knowledge and uh, just uh, we started learning together and now we're, we're just having a lot of fun uh, building new things and uh, being like on the on the bleeding edge of tech so it's challenging but also very very rewarding as well i i want to start off with the question uh so in the manifesto you know it talks about like darkness and the importance of of darkness and maybe yeah can you explain like what does that mean and you know why what does that like world look like that would you know you sort of trying to get us to so we put this emphasis on on darkness um within our thesis not as like something which is um uh like necessarily bad and scary but actually um something that's uh something empowering um so it's within the context that we're currently in which is like the whole of the technological paradigm is basically defined by surveillance um which is the kind of like whiteness all pervasive whiteness which is has the effect of like flattening any kind of discourse um you know it it, it cancels out political differences and you know in in the worst case scenario which we're heading towards in inside of crypto um you know people from certain jurisdictions cannot access the systems uh, due to KYC um, and other processes that restrict the, uh, the, the kind of users who can use those tools. So darkness is, is a counterpoint to this. Uh, it's a, um, a universe where, uh, which anyone can access irrespective of their nationality or political beliefs. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a resistance to this, uh, kind of all pervasive whiteness. Um, and it's also a kind of new beginning. Uh, so it's like a, a new dawn of, of, um, a new kind of paradigm of technology that we see coming into play, uh, as a reaction to this paradigm of surveillance, but also increasingly enabled by zero knowledge cryptography, which offers like incredibly flexible, um, uh, programmable uh, privacy. So, you know, the, the two kind of um, symbols that I, I used to, to talk about, like this this light versus the, the, the whiteness of surveillance, is it's kind of like a forest and a desert. So forests, um, you know, they're, uh, 
they, they offer a kind of coverage where um, within a forest, uh, the people are protected so they can organize, you know, they can, um, and they have this, this tree coverage that, you know, protects them from attacks. Um, and it's also a kind of sanctuary for ecosystems. You know, it's like a natural environment, like incredibly diverse um, and very dark, but also very natural. And then on the other side, we have like a desert, which is this kind of um, encroach, encroachment of this kind of lifelessness, you know. Um, and in a desert, like everything is completely surveilled and under the monopolizing view of the sun. Uh, so they're the kind of two um, symbols that that we can use. So it's it's dark in the sense of it as a forest or like under deep underwater or like the outer space. Yeah, uh, in our conception of history, um, there is a, a conflict, the, the existence, the origin of civilization between state-based forms and what we call the democratic nation, which all the value that come from in society come from, come from people, it comes from this democratic tendency, and the state exists as this hierarchical, you know, uh, social stratification, this complexification of, of social relations between people. Um, and they've always been in conflict, you know, history is not like a straight line from, you know, uh, tribal society to centralized society. There were many reversions and swings both ways. There are many strong examples. Like in England, we had the Digger movement. Um, There's also the the Boudicca who fought against the Romans. There was the Cossacks, which were you know military com communes that fought against the Russian Empire. The also the the ninja the democratic ninja provinces of Iga and Koba in Japan that was where the the ninjas came from you know where these uh, uh, democratic provinces uh, run by peasants um, also the Iroquois confederation which was a huge confederation that lasted many many centuries in in the North America so as Rose alluded to um, there is this concept of the dark forest and um, the, the, the idea that we have is uh, there are uh, forest or, or mountain topologies where you go around the environment and everything is distinct, there's distinctness around, around you and the kind of mindset that fosters is a, is a polytheistic mindset, you know, it's one of, of uh, diversity and you know uh, alliances between people and and this is kind of the 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 squad wealth thesis of crypto or the tribal kind of conception of of defi what defi is enabling uh, but the other one is the the monotheistic desert tendency which is uh, flat ground where you are in the center and you see to the horizon and everything that you see is around you is is with you at the center and and so this is where like sun worship comes from. The sun is a hot static object in the sky that represent authority, the sun god. So that is the other regfi side of crypto that we see this kind of like emerging. And it's kind of interesting because in the bull phases of the market, uh, the market starts to become saturated with this cheap fiat credit that's, pr that's printed and it starts to flow in and valuations start to flow up. And the VCs who are largely based in the US start to have this like undue ideological influence on, on on crypto rather they well they use the coercive force of of capital of money and you get a lot of these projects where it, we we just saw this last vc pump cycle just before this last dip i i actually exited because i kind of sensed that retail was exhausted from the last one this one was a vc pump we saw like ridiculous projects getting funded like Soul Chicks, or I, I also saw a, a, a ZK project which got 30 million and I was like, well, who's this team? Like nobody knows this team and it's a Silicon Valley VC scam pump, you know, scam other VCs. So you get these projects that have a huge amount of money and they hire all these like managers and bureaucracy and, and, and you know, people who do like nonsense work and they just occupy positions in this hierarchy and you have these devs at the bottom. And the devs don't, they just get orders from the top. 
and they they don't even like follow anything that's going on. They're just like tools, like little robots. And uh, and the consequence of that is uh, the projects become very inefficient. You know, you haven't got this like convergence between like the devs who have knowledge of zk and the DeFi token engineers uh, and uh, to like actually build like solid you know projects. It just becomes this inefficient like many degrees of separation coordination thing and it needs more and more money and it's this monster that, that, that grows and the bureaucracy class just like enlarges relative to the other classes. So we see that in like the bull market phases of the, of the market and it kind of reminds me of ex major extinction events in prehistory, you know, where you see these like complex ecosystems which get wiped out, just get blown away and then there's this bacteria you know, there was actually the Permian Triassic extinction where there was literally one species of animal that looked like a pig, which like it was around for 20 million years, like literally 90% of all life on the land was this one species of animal that like after this major extinction event, and it was just like, it, it was just like non-specialized, it just ate grass and bits of crap. So we, we kind of see that happen, which is these complex social hierarchies get get like pushed into a very kind of flat hierarchy. Um, and the strategy shifts from, you know, like optimizing for kind of profit to competing for market share. So it's the, all these like new niches open up because the big dinosaurs die off and everybody starts racing to occupy those niches. And you have to be adaptable, you have to be able to, and that, that's kind of like the organisms that do success for after major extinction events is they have like lots of young and they don't invest much time in their young, but they just like, you know, like cockroaches, they can like eat toothpaste, they can survive nuclear blasts, you know, they can live in extreme cold. So we're, we're, we're like, there's like two major theses for crypto. One is the super cycle uh, meme, which we kind of see is, is the case where crypto gets co-opted by this influx of cheap credit and it loses its like ideological edge. But we're actually banking on the other one, which is the regulatory extinction event, which actually will create this kind of winter, but it's actually good for crypto because structurally it's bullish because it, it, it hones its like ideological edge and it allows like the, the more meaningful, like really interesting design space of ZK and other crypto primitives that are being conceptualized now to like fully embody or realize itself. You know, the problem with the kind of bull market stuff is uh, um, like uh, projects with an edge get starved of resources, it gets suffocated out of existence. So I want to, uh, I think there's a lot to unpack here. I, I want to cut, uh, I want to come back to this for a second, but I want to quickly go back to the, uh, to the forest analogy really quick, just to make sure I understand understand it, which is, but one, I'll say like, you know, the term dark forest means almost something different in, crypt, in crypto now because of just the MEV stuff. But I'd argue that it's almost the opposite where like, you know, the issue with the dark forest refers to this like thing in, in most blockchains with like MEV attacks where you can see in the mempool. But arguably, in my opinion, that's actually a, a, an issue of an overly white forest, right? Where it's like the problem, in my opinion, is that the mempool is too visible and everyone can surveil the mempool and see exactly what everyone else is doing. And that's kind of a problem. That's sort of what I spend most, a lot of my time working on is like, how do we create encrypted mempools? But anyways, uh, but so about like, you know, how this relates to like history. So, you know, I've talked to uh, Zuko a bunch about this and, you know, how, do you think that is this also related to this idea about like legibility and like, you know, I'm sure, you know, the, there's a the famous book, like seeing like a state and it's about like, it claims that like, you know, that these systems of like legibility uh, are used to allow the state to be more um, pervasive in people's everyday life. And like, you know, Zuko's, you know, cl you know, he doesn't like to share his address for example with anyone partially partially for, for privacy security reasons but also partially he like claims that like you know the ideas of like addresses and last names are ways that help the state like organize and like you know organize people which then in turn makes them easier to surveil um is is this concept related or do you see this as a different um you know is it same or is your view of like dark spaces 
saying something different than like this legibility concept. No, I, I definitely think it's connected. And I would also say to your point um, about the dark forest in, in the book, the dark forest, the solution to um, the dark forest, like the fact that the universe is a dark forest. So essentially, for those who don't know, the, the sci-fi three body problem, three part series, it says that um, the universe is basically full of life. And because of this, there's like this complex game of theory that plays out where um, the best strategy is to instantly destroy life as it emerges because otherwise you, it might attack you. So you have these civilizations, the most advanced ones, which are just like surveilling the entire entire universe and just waiting for life to emerge to, to send nukes. But uh, the solution to the dark forest in the book is that the, the earth needs to evolve like a shield, you know, like a kind of membrane around it that protects it. So it, it's also a situation, it's kind of a misnomer because... In, in, the, in the sense of how we're using dark, because for us, dark implies encryption, uh, you know, like uh, defensive membranes. But uh, in the case of the book, the dark applies uh, exposure, the, that everyone's hiding behind these forests, these trees, but if, they're, if they move their head, they'll get killed. In relation to your question, uh, I think it's definitely part of the same uh, kind of collection of ideas. So... Uh, when I talk about the forest, I, I usually give a, um, a kind of anecdote, which is that um, in uh, after the late Ice Age, so like 10,000 years ago, um, all of Europe was covered in forest. Um, and in Ireland, where I'm from, uh, over time, these forests evolved to be like the center of society. So um, out of 16,000 place names in Ireland, 13,000 of them refer to trees in the name. And many, many Irish surnames have trees also referenced in the name. And even the Irish alphabet uh, was first came from, it was named after trees. So trees had this like amazing legacy in Irish history. And they were also the spiritual center of society. Um, so they were sacred, sacred places. Um, and what happened was, and they were community owned actually in, in the Brehan law, it said that the trees were like collectively owned. And if you damage them, you'd be killed with really high penalties. Anyway, uh, during British colonization, these trees were cleared. And they were cleared because it was very profitable, but also because um, they were where Irish people were lived, but also organized and were able to stage like guerrilla attacks. So they were the primary line of defense for, for Irish people. Um, and after the, they were cleared, um, the, the, the process of colonization was like basically uh, easy because there was no defenses. Um, so, so I see a similar kind of uh, thing happening now to in the interaction between surveillance and society. Uh, it's this kind of encroach encroachment, which is which is removing the ability of people to resist or to even have like sanctuary and and, and spirituality in the digital world. I, I haven't thought about it in relation to the book you mentioned on legibility. I haven't read it, but I think it's it's part of the same response. You know, so it's part of the same feeling. One thing I also remember from the manifesto, it talks about, you know, creating this space that's like impenetrable by law enforcement. And, and of course, like law enforcement is very much something that's, you know, a political thing connected with, you know, nation states today, right? Mostly. So I'm, I'm curious, like what in this forest desert analogy and and in maybe in general, in terms of like this intersection between, you know, this world and like today's nation states and political systems, like how can, yeah, we would just be curious, like what your thoughts are on that. I think uh, our goal is mostly to create these dark, safe spaces on, in which, uh, remember like the US said they kill people based on metadata, like this was a famous quote. I think what we're creating is these safe ecosystems where we can not hide, but just like live safely in. And uh, with these, we, we are able to express all our uh, full freedom in our uh, financial systems and our political systems. Like zero knowledge technology allows us to do this in a, in a very proper way. I just have one thing to add. What Ivan said about killing people based off metadata is uh, they have a new type of US drone now, 
which is called the RX9. And I, I only heard, I heard about it in concept like two years ago, but literally one month ago is the first example I've seen of it being used in a field. And what this drone is, is the missile, instead of exploding on impact, what it does, it has ninja swords. It's called a ninja missile. And the swords come and they slice up a single human target. So they have now ninja, they have like missiles, drone, drones, which are run by artificial intelligence. So it's automated weaponry. And these can fly in the sky for hours and hours on end, tracking like a huge area of ground. And when the AI detects someone, who match his face match a certain profile, um, it launched a missile, and the missile go with these ninja swords, and, and they had a picture of the body of the person. Literally, it was sliced into pieces. Like his, his hand was here, his, like, a bit of his arm was here. It was literally cut into little cubes by these swords. So it went, and it's just a tiny, like one person. It doesn't cause any collateral damage. So also China unveiled now that they have... Uh, um, they've made their own version of Boston Dynamics. If people search uh, China Big Dog on YouTube, they literally have like an uh, like rows and rows and rows of these as a big flex. So uh, for me, that's a uh, that's like a terror scenario where you know, okay, right now you can they're using these ninja weapons on you know brown people in the Middle East. Like who cares? But you know, like, how, what's, the, what's the threshold when, you know, the economy's going bad, you know, they, they're trying to extract more wealth from people, but it's not working, you know, people are becoming poorer, things become more unstable, you know, what's the threshold before, you know, they cross over into using, like, ninja missiles on people in, in, in developed nations in their own backyard? I saw a video today on uh, Facebook's metaverse where they were like, they were essentially bringing up all of these uh, conflicts in the developing world, like the Tigrayan conflict in Ethiopia, which is an old conflict about ideology between, you know, different factions that have like long-term history. But the, the documentary literally reduced it down to, um, oh, there are brown people killing each other uh, Facebook doesn't have censorship there, you know, and they had like a token brown person crying on camera. And it was like this call for like surveillance, for the surveillance censorship architecture to like be policing like people on the internet. So then we're heading in that direction fully. There's like enough voices that are pushing for it. And it's the strange thing is, is it used to be the liberal classes that were defending freedom of speech. Now they're the ones that are actually calling for censorship. So crypto is our best hedge against that AI surveillance, you know, censorship future. It's like, you know, our means of, and I, I, I say let's push for like maximum defense. Let's push for maximum, def maximum equipping of the people. Like everybody should be a minute man. Everybody, you know, the, the old ideal of, you know, there's, there's no army. You are the army, like the best. Defense is not on the edges, in the periphery, it's throughout the entire organism, a good immune system, you know, where people have a sense of community, you know, people are like in touch with each other, or like are, are looking at what happens in their own local neighborhoods. This is the vision of the future that the crypto is transpiring. The vision of the AI mega machine is, is, is one of... Uh, you know, that, that meme people talk about, which is um, the Great Reset. You know, they have their website. They took the video down, but the website, it had a video, and the quote in the video was, you will own nothing and you will be happy. That, that's the future they're giving us, like, that we own nothing. We're just, like, constantly moving around place to place, living on the edges, doing odd jobs to survive. Anything we, we need, we have to rent it. You know, we're already exploited by paying rent to landlords, you know, our parents' generation who they got stuck in this algorithm where they get credit from the bank and they buy a property and they don't, and they just buy and hold the property. It's like the Bitcoin maxis. They're like, I'll oh, just hodl, you know, and then like the rest of us, the millennials and the Zoomers, we're like paying these exorbitant rents that just keep skyrocketing.
I mean, you're mentioning like drones and, you know, these robots and these things. And of course, those are like, you know, things in the physical reality. And now, you know, these other things, okay, there's like crypto and, you know, you can make your transaction maybe from your phone, your computer, and you can have some activity there, but you're still, you know, subject to, you know, wherever you live. I remember, um, you know, when I read The Sovereign Individual, this book that like predicted like so many things. Right. But like one of the things that he also predicted in this book was that there would be an explosion in the number of nation states and you would kind of have these big states kind of crumble and there would be this renaissance where people like create new countries and with like, you know, different, different rules, different ideas. So I'm wondering is like, do you think this is, is, is something like that possible? You see something like that coming or is it focused really more fully on this metaverse? Or, or you know digital realm yeah so i'm i'm very optimistic um about cuz Def- so ethereum foundation you know they tried to create this radical markets vision and fr- from the top down and it never really got adopted by the community you know there was no enthusi- there was no latent enthusiasm for that but defi started off as something that was very nihilistic it was about like just making gains and it still is like a large part of it, but what we see is that there are some um, tendencies, some di- some democratic tendencies that exist. And these are threads that kind of need to be drawn out, and so that that's what we're 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 trying to do. And and the important thing is is that these networks they're very real. They're not just cyber or virtual. There is um, uh, like like we're seeing now with the free Rostal. Um, which they just raised uh, 14 million, and you know that's something that's that's very real and impactful, and um, and and I, I think it was the the uh, owner of uh, Ave who was talking in EFCC. He was I saw a speech by his in which he was talking about how it was basically a rallying cry to DeFi users that look we have this liquidity we need to start branching this liquidity to local communities. We need to start making things move, making things happen. Um, so this process that you talk about, the, the feudal breakup, which happens at the end of empire, which happened, for example, with the Roman Empire when it broke up, it's, it's something that's in process. Like we're seeing in Europe now the breakdown of the European Union, the rise of these, these nationalistic uh, uh, feudal entities like Europe is is definitely heading towards a feudal reality, um, and the 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 also the big shift from uh, a unipolar U.S. centric world where a lot of their dominance and power is based off of the petrodollar financial network, which is now being being challenged by these emerging powers of Russia and China, uh, but also this uh, emergent crypto class which. Although we're quite small in terms of significance, um, the, we're exponentially increasing. And, you know, like there's something to be said for a technology whose time has come when in the past, you know, uh, the printing press came or many new technologies came, which an old class whose power was threatened, um, you know, wanted to stop that technology from, from you know, embodying or, or manifesting, and but they they and they had to be gra- dragged kicking and screaming into the future against their own their will. But it happened, and you know the thing is is that you know we don't have to worry about crypto adoption happening or not happen happening because it's going to happen. It's it's practically an inevitability based off of the the strength and latent power of this technology. What we do have to to worry about or think about is um, how is how is it going to manifest itself in, in in the future? Like, what is going to be the 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 end result? You know, and we have at the root of the base of this thing the ability to shape its outcome through uh, uh, the the paradigm, the mental paradigms that we form, which is how you know typically scientific the Kuhnian conception of scientific revolutions where, you know, for example, when the Copernican theory first came about, it did not explain um, the motions of the stars and the planets better than the Ptolemaic model. But 
um, all Copernicus was saying is that, you know, here is um, a, another theory which I feel is more elegant, like a, a better explanation, but it still took a lot of research and development of that model by scientists to make it competitive with the Ptolemaic model and, and eventually take over the, from the Ptolemaic model. Usually in a, in a, when there's a dominant scientific paradigm, you know, there is enough paradoxes and inconsistencies that start to arise about and the model, the, the, the dominant mental model have to be patched so much that it starts to like, it starts to sag under its own weight. And then what, what, what basically give the impetus for this shift in consensus among the scientific community is when somebody is able to, you know, uh, when, when an opposition voice that has been uh, promoting a, 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 another paradigm, that paradigm, you know, starts to win gains. And you see the same thing with many historical struggles where there is initially a small group of people that, you know, they, they were a minority voice, but, um, you know, and, and, and maybe struggling for a long time. And, but then, you know, events start to shift the balance in their favor because, you know, their, their thesis become validated. And essentially, we're, then we have a thesis about the crypto market, which is that crypto is fundamentally antagonistic with these powers. There's like no way of resolving it. You know, you can clip the wings of every, you know, crypto project in the space or, and, and, you know, try to, um, you know, toe the line. Uh, but essentially, the only vision of crypto that will be tolerated is a crypto which is harmless, which has been defanged. And we know, we might be saying, well, that's suicidal because the US is losing its edge and it has so much intellectual capital, not only intellectual capital, but you know that's the main thing of crypto in, based in the US, and yet they want to cull their own edge over the rest of the world. But you know, we're not dealing with a rational um, elite class. We're dealing with a self-interested neoliberal elite class, you know, that wants to maintain global hegemony. You know, the, you know, the uh, Trump, try, Trump tried to withdraw uh, from, you know, an overextended US empire. But what we saw is that the deep state is too powerful. Like the deep state has its own interests that are orthogonal to the interests of the, of the uh, populace. So, you know, you mentioned this uh, multipolar world and so, okay, you know, reading your stuff, I know you're a big advocate of, like, anarchism. Um, and so one of my sort of – I'm actually a big fan of multipolar systems because one of my, like, sort of theses on society is that – effect. I, I think that when you get into, like, in sort of a hyper-anarchist system, what ends up happening is that power will – you, you'll get people who step in to sort of be these, you know, whether it's through demagoguery or like po you, you, it, hyper anarchism leads to populism, which then leads to like high levels of centralization and like dictatorship. While when you instead go for something that's more multipolar, that you can like play the game theory of it against each other to prevent the rise of a single centralization centralized system. So like my, my theory is that like, you know, you either if you if you try to make something too decentralized, what ends up happening is you go in these like cycles of hyper decentralization and hyper centralization and these like big, you know, swing swings that keep going forever. But meanwhile, like, you know, if you start with something that's somewhere in the middle, you can actually sort of have this like, you know, dampen the level of that swing. And that's kind of what I think was was sort of brilliant of the original founding document like system of the United States, where like it was designed as this republic rather than a democracy, knowing that like, hey, you know, a pure anarchic democratic system will lead to hyper populism. But like so by having this like sort of multipolar republic e system, you can do that. And, and I think the same thing applies to like economics, where I think that like hyper competition leads to monopolies. The way to prevent monopolies is to allow for m oligopolies to form where these like 
powers are like holding each other in check. And I think the same thing applies in a geopolitical sense, which is kind of what you're talking about. Um, yeah. What, what, what do you think about this? Like, how do you how do you how do you reconcile your like the views on anarchism with this like empirical swings that we've seen historically? Yeah, so we're not uh, anarchists. Um, we do have a lot of sympathy for the anarchist position. We're actually democratic confederalists. Um, you know, we're big fans of Abdullah Ocalan, who was the leader of the PKK and wrote a series of three books called A Manifesto for a Democratic Civilization. And so, in, so let's talk about first the, the good points of anarchism that we sympathize with. So first of all, um, the anarchists, you know, uh, they, okay, they, 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 so in the time of uh, the enlightenment, you know, there are, there's the ideology of um, liberalism was one main contender. And then there was ideology of socialism and, you know, nationalism, was an outgrowth of the socialist movement. And another contender was the anarchists. And the anarchists did not achieve power in any meaningful way. Um, they also uh, criticized, you know, uh, capitalism, but from the side of the extreme left. Um, and so, whereas the Marxists said that, you know, capitalism would be progressive, the anarchists, you know, they seemed it as some, they saw the system there was emerging as something that was ultimately doomed to decay. Um, but, you know, they also had, um, uh, compared to the Marxists, they had a much more realistic conception of power and the state, a, a critique which of, of the Marxists, which was that you would end up with um, a bureaucratic state which would be more dangerous than uh, capitalism itself, which is, which is what happened. And the... Uh, they were they were also right in their, uh, the the nation state was a huge loss for the values of uh, equality and freedom, uh, and they argued instead for confederalism. Um, also, their 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 views and criticism of bureaucratization, industrialization, urbanization were for a large part spot on and correct. They had an ecological dimension to their critique. Um, and uh, they were also they were also correct about um, uh, their analysis of of, of the uh, Marxists as as as, not, as being a new form of uh, bureaucratic state capitalism. So, and and now about anarchism, where it started to go wrong is that anarchists came from uh, the Enlightenment, and you know they were kind of corrupted by positivism. So, um, and, and part of that was, you know, their demand that the state be abolished, like immediately and at all costs, which was, is completely, unfortunately, like unrealistic and, and utopian. Uh, and a, a, big op a big obstacle was their, their opposition to any type of authority, even like, legitimate forms of authority, which meant that they had an inability to uh, conceptualize, uh, you know, the, what a system for what we were talking about, the democratic nation would look like, and how, you know, we can work together to uh, enable that vision, to put the steps forward, to have a strategy to enable that vision. So, you know, we we criticize the anarchist movement on, on that basis that yes, there needs to be some type of strategic thought, there needs to be some form of leadership, there needs to be some way of people moving together, you know, but oh, but in terms of the, the values or the critique, we, we, we agree with those. Um, I just like to quickly add some thoughts on that. Um, because I thought that suddenly the, the, the way that you framed the question was very interesting in terms of these kind of the kind of ebbs and flows of history. Um, it's kind of Marx, Marxist in a way. Um, but the I, I agree with you, and I, and I think history does have phases. And, you know, it's, it's it shouldn't be our goal to work against those kind of ebbs and flows of history in, in, in a way. Um, so that's the issue that 
um, that we have with the concept of utopia, um, which is sometimes promoted by people in the crypto space, where utopia assumes that you have a future society which is perfect, and and so it's unchanging, uh, which sounds like a really bad thing. It sounds like a, a, a like a authoritarian megastate. Um, so instead, like we we should have this kind of future which is like subject to the natural ebbs and flows of history. Um, and in terms of those kind of phases, I think we're in the midst, we're in the middle of a shift at the moment from this kind of uh, materialist era uh, into something more ideational. And, and this is a pattern we see throughout history um, where, you know, we have these kind of religious ideational phases, which are followed by more material phases. And we just had in the West this kind of flip fairly recently. You know, we had the Middle Ages followed by the Enlightenment, um, followed by the, the modernity, where the Enlightenment was kind of a a, a mixed phase, which mixed uh, religious elements with materialist elements. Um, and we see throughout history that these moments of transition are actually the most generative. Um, and, and I think we're, we're in the midst of a kind of transitionary era where we have both these materialist tendencies and the ideational tendencies. Um, and crypto is a really good example of, of, of a movement which demonstrates both aspects. Um, but there's also a kind of pattern that we see a lot where uh, these kind of revolutions, especially recently, revolutions get captured by more organized groups. So, you know, all across the Arab Springs, various revolutions, one after the other, co-opted by militant Islam. So, you know, there, there's also the risk that, that crypto could have it's vulnerable to a similar kind of takeover. And that's why we also really emphasize that crypto develop its own kind of ideological position, you know, and its own its own voice, um, so that it's organized enough, um, both practically, but also philosophically, um, to resist that kind of takeover. Is that another thing I, I, I think it was mentioned in the manifesto, maybe or somewhere else, but this idea of like a moral fiber and you know civilization having a moral fiber like what's the connection between crypto and yeah and, and sort of moral fiber the, this this is actually a, a a version of the philosophy again Ochlan, uh especially his third book where he talks about the um the moral and political uh, fabric of society um and that's a really interesting concept because he kind of talks about, he says like, okay, there's something outside of the nation state, which is society, but what constitutes that society and its values? Um, so he tries to do a kind of history of like, there are places like he calls nations where, which are these kind of I ideological consistencies where um, the, the people's political will is expressed. Um, so that's what Marlin political uh, society is. It's basically the 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 emergent political and moral properties of the of the society um, that they uphold. So it offers a kind of a new axis on which to build like governance systems, um, uh, and 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 that's what we're referring to in the manifesto. Yeah. So if you look up the definition of uh, society on Wikipedia. It will say society is defined as the social relations between a group of people, but underneath a dominant morality and politics. So when we when we talk about uh, empowerment of society, um, a big question is, uh, OK, so how is that political system and what is that moral framework? Does it does it exist to empower society or does it exist to disempower kind of society, you know, in favor of like this nation state. So, um, you know, in terms of, and, and uh, what Ochilan, so typically when people talk about politics, the way people talk about politics is the politics is, you know, the study of power, it's the practice of power, but that is actually a kind of corruption which is a consequence of the ideology of the system that we live in today because uh, politics is is the activity that we as people engage in um, you know that's concerned with c concerning uh, our freedom our security our well-being um, and 
you know, uh, the, the way that the system conceptualize uh, politics now is that, you know, people are pre-political, you know, people have like innate desires that they're born with and that they can't be changed. But um, actually, the way that you design your political system or your institution can actually, um, actually has, a, has a, this kind of feedback loop with the kind, of, um, the kind of values that people have in society. And actually, the way that you design your political framework can uh, assist people in becoming more individuated, people to become more spiritual, to develop a more public nature. When the goal of politics essentially is to multiply public spaces. And when we are engaging in this kind of discourse of politics with other people, what we're essentially doing is, you know, we're, we're learning to uh, empathize with other people. We're learning about how to negotiate for our interests. You know, we're, we're learning about how to uh, do discourse. So um, that kind of nature uh, is, is a very healthy uh, tendency to encourage um, in terms of society. And so when we talk about uh, 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 morality, we're essentially talking about the ideational aspect, the, the belief system, because we were talking earlier about paradigms and how paradigms act as a form of consensus that get people who, who have knowledge of techniques, who have this form of power over the material world, to get them to uh, kind of work together in a coordinated way towards realizing some kind of vision of the future. And so that's like, that's important to instill into people. It's like, otherwise you get this reality where you have, you know, uh, the visionary is like one, one dictator at the top and you've got bureaucracy and you've got devs at the bottom who are just essentially tools, tools that are being used to implement the will of somebody else, like a, a giant mechanism. And the consequence of that form of human social organization is that it leads to a type of technology which become overly complex, which is a type, which is a type of mega techniques. And that's why we have so, uh, that's why the systems that we use today are very inhumane, it's because they're made by gigantic corporations which, you know, enslave developers. The developers are just, they're just a tool in a big apparatus. We need to get away from this vision of technology. The, the, both the user and the developer need to become synonymous. You know, people need to participate in, in constructing the paradigm. Just to add on Amir's thoughts about morality and these things is like we as skilled developers must like feel the need to, to help our society, the people we live, uh, we live with. And uh, in order to, like Amir mentions that like programmers are being degraded into robots by their oppressors, who are usually like, their bosses in a company. Uh, crypto allows us to fight fight against this, so we can finally like capture value, um, capture value in the in the in, in our own projects, not having to work for a for a paycheck every month, but actually like if we're skilled enough, we can we can fulfill our moral moral need to help our society. So you know, it, it sounds like. What, there's a claim here that's being made that like society is or civilization has these like ups and downs and like you know there's a book that I like uh, or like by Peter Turchin it's called like secular cycles and it kind of like shows that like hey you know society does have these like very clear ups and downs and it's almost like very Malthusian in a way but like um, you know the, 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 there's this quote which is like the uh, uh, hard times create strong men, strong men create good times, good times create weak men, and weak men create hard times. Strong and friend create many tendies. Many tendies uh, create yes. weak friends. Weak friends <laughs> create few tendies. You claim that it's because of this like sort of moral degradation of society. Um, and the question is, I guess, like, so you think that there's a way of reversing that? Like, can, can do you think that, like, we can fight against these cyclical trends or is it sort of um, inevitable? Like, I mean, I know like your Twitter bio has the, has the quote about like, uh, you know, a society that separates its scholars from its warriors will have its thinking done by cowards and fighting by fools. And like, you know, you, I guess, obviously in a way personified this idea of like, hey, you know, you know, with your like stint in Rahava and stuff, like, 
Do you think that there's a way of like reversing the moral like change like way direction of society, or is it sort of inevitable? Um, I just want to say quickly before I pass to the others that um, there's also a kind of um, geography to this discussion where different parts of the world undergo, there are different pa- step, parts of the cycle at the same time. So I think we're seeing a shift from like the, the Western centric paradigm toward, you know, like societies emerging there in Africa and the Middle East. Um, so I think possibly the West is beyond saving, maybe. Um, but these are new societies that we can put our attention on that, you know, are like in a, in a really good position also for adopting everything that's happening now in crypto. Like Jordan Peterson seems to be on this like mission to like, see like, Hey, can we use like narrative, new narrative structuring to like reinstill like moral fibers within society? Like, is this a worthwhile cause that can be accomplished? I I think the... Uh, if you you know uh, John McCarthy, he uh, he's the guy that invented the term artificial intelligence. He also invented the concept of the time sharing operating system and uh, computer networks. And the reason why he invented that was because he was a communist. And essentially, what he was seeing were you know there were these giant computers which, you know, if you wanted to use them, uh, you had to make an appointment and they were owned by military and, um, and in industry. And he had the idea, he was like, what if a computer was shared between everybody? What if a computer was like an electrical utility? You just go, you plug into the wall and you can use a bit of that computer. And the outcome of that was the, the forming of uh, of the project by J.R. Licklider, which I forgot the name of it right now, but that project led to the development of ARPANET, which led to the development of the internet. It was a direct lineage, and then also formed the basis between the for the modern conception of the operating system, which became realized with Unix. So that massive leap in uh, computer architecture design uh, happened uh, because of a a guy who had a certain ideological leap or or mental leap that other people were not able to think about. i give another example. Um, I I read all of the letters of Ada Lovelace uh, uh, between her sister and other people, including Charles Babbage. Charles Babbage, he designed the first computer. Now, the computer did not get built because he, you know, was uh, very autistic and he kept changing the design and he kept arguing with people. And you can see in Ada's letters that she was very, very frustrated because she realized that this was something of huge magnitude. This was in the 1840s. The first computer would not be actually built until World War II in the 1950s, where it was built for the war effort. But in the 1840s, you know, Ada Lovelace, she was trying to get Babbage's computer to be realized, and she was the first programmer. Uh, She she was designing computer programs on paper, and she was a a woman that she was uh, was obsessed with mathematical beauty, but also the social nature of of reality. And um, in her papers, you can see you can see her writing where she's saying that the computer is a tool that will have uh, tremendous significance. The uh, there should be one in every single person's home. That people will be able to create music on them. People will be able to create artworks with them. And the thing is, at that time, nobody was able to see the importance of the computer except Ada Lovelace. Everybody else thought that it was just like an interesting kind of tool for uh, industrial applications. They didn't realize that there was a greater social magnitude, and so there wasn't as big a push to get this device realized. It was one person who sadly was way ahead of her time. It would not be 150 years later, 50 years after the computer was built in the 1950s, 
when people would start using computers to make computer graphics and artwork and etc. So, you know, uh, oftentimes, uh, oftentimes, it, it, you know, um, it's like when I look at the VCs now, um, there's a lot of mid IQ range normie tier VCs who they go, what's next? What's the next big thing in crypto? NFTs, blockchain gaming. You know, they just they're just saying like whatever you know cool thing that they've heard around. They can't. They they're not able to imagine what the future is. You know, it's whereas what we're seeing now with zk is like holy crap. It like opened up a huge new design space, like an untapped design space. There's so much great things that we can create that we dreamed about 20 years ago. And in fact, you know, the, the vision of the Unix operating system that they wanted to make back in the 80s, it was constrained by, you know, resource constraints, by, uh, uh, you know, uh, by the tools that they had available to them then. Uh, by the, uh, you know, like they didn't have ZK cryptography, you know, uh, they didn't have like uh, consensus algorithms, the computers were slow, but they built something that was, that, that changed the world, changed the world of computing. And what, we're, what we have now is we have the tooling and, 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 and the economic resources and the computer power to fully realize that vision that was started in the 80s and to and to, there's there's been a big break like the computer has not changed since the 80s we, we're still using the same type of operating system i mean like if i open uh, if i want to like edit something on on a document people are using google docs you know if i want to edit a picture i have to edit, create the picture and send it to someone but like now we can network the computers we can we can create applications that uh, enable new forms of human activity that weren't before possible you know uh, ross ulbricht when he made the silk road in the beginning he said oh you know i'm just making an economic simulation let's let's see where this goes you know that's that's what he said when he announced it i'm working on an economic simulation you know let a thousand simulations bloom I guess maybe this kind of leads into like DarkFi and what you guys are building right now. So like, what are, what do you see as like the big problems that need to be tackled? Um, yeah, what, what, what do you think are like the big ideas that like crypto can help fix? So obviously one of them, you know, obviously there's this idea of privacy, but like even within privacy, what are like, you know, do you think it's privacy of exchange, privacy of communication, privacy of what are the problems that you that you hope to be able to solve? Well, we want to firstly, like we want to solve uh, the thing of getting back our sovereignty. All the current chains are just being uh, they're being surveilled and controlled and uh People just don't have their privacy left anymore. Like uh, finally, we have this uh, these zero knowledge mechanisms that are built, and we're able to use them properly. Uh, in, also, in DarkFi, our one of our goals is like empowering developers. So what we are also building is like a simplified simplified tooling and simplified mechanisms for developers to just be able to use and and write their own uh, zk algorithms on products. So uh, what we can build with zero knowledge, uh, most of these things are completely anonymous. So we can finally have anonymous voting, anonymous DAOs, we can have futures markets with uh, like uh, different kind of liquidation engines. Amir actually has a really cool design for this, he can maybe mention. Uh, we can also like help journalists and whistleblowers to, to leak data, to like encrypt and sell this, auction this data in zero knowledge. And this uh, is all finally like hidden from any kind of adversary who is just watching what's happening on the chain, and you avoid many of many many consequences. Like also by using mixnets and uh, parallel networks. Uh, one of them is uh, uh, actually I spoke to one of them uh, uh, earlier last week. Uh, is NIM, and it's a mixnet that also allows us to to hide our traffic. So. Then uh, these mixnets combined with zero knowledge 
uh, gives us the ultimate power of just uh, being able to hide anything we're doing on the internet and uh, be safe and just uh, to be sovereign. Yeah, I think that was beautifully said. And I just add that, like, from the kind of the technical side, the the main problem that we're trying to solve is also that we have this uh, incredible technology which has been developed over the course of crypto, which is ZK. Um, but so far, it's very obscure and it's it's very hard for developers to use or understand. Um, so the main problem now is just to make tooling so that it's very easy for developers to make any kind of uh, privacy application. And there are many then problems from the product side that like developers can solve, like I've, Ivan mentioned, like each, um, the whole technical paradigm right now is defined by surveillance. surveillance. So for each tool that's based off of da data harvesting, you can build uh, an anonymous, um, decentralized and, and like crypto incentivized alternative. Um, so, um, so that's a big, um, that's a big concern for us. Yes. And, uh, continuing on zero knowledge, we are building a smart contract language, uh, a virtual machine that executes these and, uh, also like an optimizing compiler because it's very difficult to write circuits in, in zero knowledge. Uh, you have to know, you have to deeply know algebra and how things work, but since we want people to prototype and build products, we will we decided like uh, instead of doing this by hand, these optimizations, we can actually just build a compiler, and probably the the computer is faster than the brain and can like figure these optimizations out and and make these zero knowledge circuits a lot a lot faster. Um, the thing about the language we're building is it's uh, it's a C it's a C like syntax. So basically anyone who knows anything about programming can just implement this, uh, implement products in, in, in this language. It's uh, succinct as well. So there is no kind of uh, circuit uh, configuration. You don't have to think about these. The compiler solves this for you. Uh, you just uh, implement your, uh, your, uh, your uh, algorithm, your logic on, on what you want to do. So the, on our, in our documentation, we have also examples of these. Uh, the zero knowledge backend we're using is is uh, Halo Two. Uh, we actually did some research on the community and what they want. And uh, even though Halo Two is a bit uh, slower implementation of zk uh, mechanism for zk algorithm, uh, the big point is there is no trusted setup. And this uh, immediately there is an implication of being a uh, more trustless systems. So, like many other projects are building with uh, Intel SGX or they're building with trusted setups. Uh, they might be fast, but they will always uh, like SGX will always be a black box, and you cannot always trust black boxes, even though they might be just fine. Uh, and in turn, so I've mainly been uh, focused on. Um, uh, reviewing the research and uh, applying that research. So uh, we have uh, several lines of research. So one of them is uh, in terms of the ZK algorithms themselves. So right now Halo 2 is an algorithm that's very much optimized for uh, anonymous payments. That's why it, the kind of algorithm was developed by the Zcash guys. But we're more uh, interested in the whole kind of gamut of um, applied kind of ZK. So um, there, are, there are other kind of trade-offs you can make with other ZK algos, which, for example, can allow uh, complex data structures to exist inside of ZK. So if, as long, so if you have, for example, um, the basic primitives of a set, then from a set you can construct a hash map, and then from a hash map, you can basically construct like any sort of complex data structure. Um, and so, you know, uh, there's a different way of optimizing ZK algorithms, uh, one of which is, um, you know, unknown order groups. So, you know, we're interested in, in you know, maybe taking, maybe, uh, you know, keeping the same, keep uh, replacing because right now everything's based on elliptic curves, but you know there's other types of uh, unknown order groups which you know you use other 
mathematical premises. For example, you have ideal class groups, you have a more risky newer construction, which is Jacobian hyperelliptic curves. Um, so uh, yeah, and then we we also kind of uh, prototype our algorithms in Sage Math, and you know uh, another interesting idea is the the compiler that we make right now has is very much tied to the Halo Two backend. But if we wanted to have it customizable with different al al uh, uh, algorithms on the back end, then what we could do is we can develop a Sage like intermediate like polynomial kind of uh, uh, tooling for like al algebraic like kind of compiler and then you like implement the algos on the back end. I think this is the approach that IDEM3 has taken with their, their compiler, enables them to iterate with other algorithms very quickly. Um, and you know, Starks, uh, there's different types of uh, uh, recursivity. So the recursivity, which is used in Halo 2 is so that you have these uh, two attic curves which can, where the scalar field is the base field of the other and vice versa. And so, you know, you, you can create a verifying circuit inside of ZK and then construct all these proofs that you amortize at the end. You like combine them into one using the bulletproof trick. But there are other ways of doing that. For example, uh, people build uh, a Stark verifier inside of like a, a, a ZK algo like Halo 2 or, or Groff 16. And then, uh, and, and, and Starks is recursive. So, you know, that's, that's one way of it. Also, um, in ZK, um, the user creates the proof. Uh, but if you have some kind of state that needs to be updated based off of secret information, then uh, you need a way to poke the smart contracts to update the state. So that's where other kind of mechanisms start to come in, which we're, we're, we're kind of uh, developing. Um, and uh, yeah, and then, and so for example, the AMM, uh, it's basically impossible to make an anonymous AMM because you have these two pools of capital where the state gets updated and that's globally visible to everyone. So the, the main technique that people use to solve that is batching. But the problem is if the batch is too small, it's not anonymous. If the batch is too big, then the price moves against you and it's capital inefficient. So the actual market mechanisms that we build in ZK have to be completely different because uh, we have a different set of constraints. To not have to deal with these constraints, um, there is, as I said, the complex data structures, um, which we're researching into earlier, but also, um, you know, you have to have a blockchain that's fast. And so then that kind of shift also the focus uh, heavily onto bridges. So we're, we're very much thinking, very much like the Cosmos model, where you have different um, uh, nodes that are running very fast, and you have bridges in and out to execute functions on the different smart contracts. Um, I know a lot of people are like in favor of the ETH L2 model. I just don't see that as, as the future, especially given the kind of shift um, in the mindset of crypto away from this like this, this single chain model to this like multi-asset, many-to-many paradigm. Um, so yeah, we're doing like a lot of um, uh, uh, kind of theoretical research on the side. You know, in a and then in a pipeline, applying that and then that applied or prototype research, making it into main where it goes into products. So we concurrently have all these tracks simultaneously, um, and there are also some interesting things that uh, Rose is also doing with uh, uh, token engineering, which is another technique that you could use to get around. Uh, restrictions with anonymity. So, for example, the way Tornado Cash distributes rewards to the people who are staking is they, they have this AMM where the reward is dripped into one side, but everybody who's staking in an epoch gets minted token one to one. So, that's like a, a financial solution to a technical, so like a, a technical problem. So, we can also leverage that. So, in terms of like what's possible with the tech, um, actually a lot is possible like you know it's you just have to like be able to think differently and that's that's the new design space we talk about like it's a door which is opened and it's there to be explored for everyone and we want to we want to bootstrap this ecosystem